Okay, so let's begin. We're in uh, downtown Montreal. And for first question, could you please state your full name? Sure. Uh, my name is Stephen Hunt. Um, and where were you born? I was born in Kentville, Nova Scotia. Okay, a fellow maritime. A maritimer, yeah. And uh, what did your parents do? Uh, my, my dad was in the Army, so I, I also grew up as an Army brat. So with that, uh, traveled all over the place and uh, relocated all through Canada. My mom uh, worked as a, as in the retail sector as a, as a, as a clerk uh, primarily in, in uh, retail. Okay. And uh, you as a child, what were your interests or pastimes? Uh, well, because I grew up on army camps and military bases, uh, you know, I was pretty familiar <laughs> with what, what was moving on around, as whether it be airplanes or tanks, and uh, and uh, yeah, I played a lot of sports, so uh, that was another good thing, I guess, about growing up as an army brat, that we had access to uh, hockey and baseball and soccer, so it was good. It was a good, good, good life. And um, when you went to school, what were your strengths or interests there? I, I think, uh, yeah, you know, just the, just the ability to learn. Uh, you know, I did well in school and um, I think I was pretty well interested in everything, probably, <laughs> probably with the exception of math, but okay. uh, but uh, most everything else. Yeah. And, and did you have an idea of kind of what you wanted to get into? kind of at the end of school? No, uh, I, because I, I was from a big, big family, parents didn't have a lot of money, so uh, if I wanted to go on to university, th that was going to be a challenge. I, uh, I thought about that coming out of school or getting to, to the end of my, uh, my school, but um, economically it wasn't possible uh, at that time for me to go. I, I, I looked uh, in trades as well, uh, tried to become a carpenter, for example, but was a massive lineup to get into even a pre-app course and uh, uh, so I, I got a job in mining and uh, with the intention well money was good uh, and I'll probably go back to school and uh, I remember one of the first guys I worked with in the mining industry he said what's your plans kid I said well you know I'll work here for a few months and probably go back to school and I remember those these words like it was yesterday he says well you know once you get the paycheck here you won't be selling shoes at Kmart uh, I didn't know what he meant there, but I do now. <laughs> so I never went back. I stayed in mining. Okay. And what were your what was your first job in the mining industry? I was uh, I was working as a drill helper in the mining industry, and uh, first time I'd ever seen a mine. And you know, also I, I remember vividly uh, going to work there, thinking, "Wow, this is like a science fiction movie." You know, I mean, massive equipment and uh, mud and rock everywhere. It was quite a quite a shock to the system. Where was it? Uh, my first mine was Island Copper. It was at the uh, in Port Hardy, uh, or outside of Port Hardy. It was a camp, uh, now closed, but uh, uh, on the north tip of Vancouver Island. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what were you mining? Copper. Okay. Copper molybdenum, and uh, that was uh, the two primaries. Yeah. So from there, where did your uh career take you in the mining industry? I, I then went to work at Afton Mines, which was uh, one of the first tech-owned mines. Tech Corporation is one of the one of the premier, still one of the last Canadian mining companies left. So I worked for them uh, at Afton Mines outside of Kamloops, uh, British Columbia. And then I, uh, I went on to staff with the steelworkers negotiating in the mining industry. Okay. So what got you into the steelworkers? Was this the first union you were involved with? No, I was with the operating engineers first, and uh, I think what I think what drew me in was, um, uh, you know, I just saw some pretty nasty stuff in the mining industry. And uh, when I was in Port Hardy, uh, the death rate uh, and injury rate was quite high, and and to me it didn't make a lot of sense. Here we are in an industry that should be pretty safe, you know, other than the size of the equipment. Uh, and the nature of the work. I mean, acknowledging that it wasn't going to be safe like working in an office. But but uh, the, we, we used to say a worker died there every six months. And it got so common that we expected it. You know, so when somebody lost their lives or was seriously injured, we just said, well, you know, it's about time. You know, that was sort of in keeping with what happened. That troubled me. And I thought, you know, there's got to be a better way. And that's probably the closest thing that drew me into the labor movement was just the realization one day that something was seriously wrong. It could be a lot safer. It could be a lot safer and people shouldn't die for a living. Yeah. yeah. Well, do you have examples of the nasty things? That, that yeah, yeah, was? yeah. Uh, you know, we had, uh, we had a fellow go through the idlers on a conveyor belt, uh, for example, and uh, you know, get pulled into a long, long, long conveyor belt. He died instantly. But, 
you know, when you, you think about it, he was using a D-handled shovel uh, to clear idlers on the bottom. But now there's a law that says you can't use a D-handled shovel. Uh, but it took a worker's death to get to that law. You know, we had a we had a worker run over by one of those big big uh, haul trucks in an open pit mine, simply because the driver couldn't see him. Now now in, in open pit mines, you'll see they all these big buggy whips with lights on them and lights on the trucks and common sense stuff that wasn't being applied. Uh, you know, it was kind of like the Wild West. You know, run a gun, let's just get the work done. Uh, and uh, you know, if somebody uh, becomes a victim of that. That's just the cost of doing business. So that that to me troubled me. So you decided to, to go to join. This was not the United Steel. <clears throat> no, it was the operating engineers. That's okay. where I started, and then uh, and then uh, stayed on with the with the steel workers when I uh, relocated to to Afton Mines in Kamloops. So that was a steel worker cert, and uh, I, I went to work, you know, on the job, just fighting, and uh, got onto a bargaining committee and. Uh, Started fighting for for workers' rights at that time, all workers' rights. So, not just health and safety, but everything. You know, compensation uh, rules with respect to how people get jobs and how you get trained. It was all important at that time because there was a lot of favoritism. I saw. You know, if you as as I called it, if you're a red apple boy, you get all the training you wanted. If you if you if you if you question some some of the stunts that supervisors were pulling, say you, you probably shouldn't do that. That would cost you an opportunity. You know, I just thought that was kind of stupid. So, did you keep working in the mining industry, or did you really kind of quickly go into more full time? Uh, well, I worked. I, I, I went when I went to work for the uh, for the steel workers. I serviced in the mining industry. So, primarily, I worked in the mining industry. Although I did ser service in other industries as well. Most of my work at that time for the first. 20 years anyway of my career was full, almost full on mining. So it was bargaining, arbitrating, um, you know, and just dealing with the day-to-day -day problems that miners have. Do you have um, examples of very difficult, um, whether it's bargaining or, or events that, that you have to deal with uh, joining this, the, the union? Oh yeah, I mean my first, uh, my first set of bargaining was with tech and um, <laughs> we couldn't even we couldn't agree on where to meet, <laughs> and it was that protracted and that difficult. We used to call it pick handle arbitration. We just hit each other till it stopped hurting, you know. And uh, it was tough. It was tough to agree on anything. They fought. Uh, the company fought uh, really, really hard to keep keep us away from anything with respect to their right to manage. So. It was difficult, and and uh, first first round of bargaining I uh, I participated in resulted in a three month strike. So it was uh, it was arduous, difficult, nasty bargaining. Now you uh, you're also wearing a, a t shirt you mentioned, uh, which has to do with uh, Westray. Yes, the Westray mining is asked to stop the killing and force the law. Yeah, stop the killing and force the law. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So could you tell us a bit about uh, Westray, the disaster, and then a bit uh, maybe what happened afterwards? Well, well, sure I can. On May 9th, 1992, the Westray mine uh, catastrophically exploded, and it killed, we think, instantly 26 workers. So it was only 26 people underground. It killed them all. So uh, that was the um, that was in Stellarton, Nova Scotia, uh, in Pictou County, depressed area. Workers went to work, and uh, 26 of them never come home. So uh, I was involved in the inquiry at the uh, Westray Mine Inquiry. So I give uh, testimony at the inquiry. I was one of the only union witnesses called. Uh, the, the mine was non-union. We were in the process of organizing the mine when it exploded. We had enough cards to apply the morning it exploded. Um, but uh, obviously, uh, you know, uh, the mine never recovered. We did apply. Uh, for certification, and we're certified at the Westray Mine, uh, and we did it symbolically uh, in the memory of those workers that died, and those workers and families and communities that were profoundly affected. And we still support uh, the family groups at uh, at 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 what, well around around Stellarton, so Trenton, New Glasgow, so that mm -hmm. area. So we're still still present in the community. We maintain the memorial uh, for the for the uh, for the 26 miners and. Uh, and interact with the family groups. Did you work on the bill at all, or trying to? Yeah, I, I did. I, I worked on the uh, that after the inquiry, after the public inquiry. 
It was interesting because I was asked specifically uh, during the inquiry two questions. Why do workers go to work when they know it's unsafe? And the second one was, was what about the regulations that were in place at the time of the explosion? Should they be changed? And the answer to the, f the second question was yes. Uh, the, the legislation in, in Nova Scotia in 1992 was antiquated. For example, there was more language in the legislation that protected the pit ponies. And pit ponies, for people that don't understand or don't know mining history, they used to bring ponies underground. Um, and the miners had to take care of them. You had to water them, you had to feed them, you, you know, and uh, you couldn't scratch them if you scratched them or rubbed them on the uh, sides of the mine, you got in serious trouble. That legislation was still in the books in 1992. They've been a pit pony underground for probably 75 years, but it was still there. Very little to protect the workers, um, uh, you know, in 1992. So that was a no-brainer. Um, and why do workers go to work uh, when it's unsafe? Um, in 1992 in Pictou County and even today in 2016, workers go to work because it's economic heroin. They get mortgages, they get pickups, they get kids to put through university, and, uh, and the money is good. So oftentimes workers will do things that they know full well they shouldn't be doing, and they do it. And, uh, and uh, we're trying to educate workers to say, you don't have to do that. Refuse to do the work if it's unsafe. Don't take a chance. And uh, recommendation 73 from the uh, Westray Inquiry was a uh, recommendation to the federal government to amend the criminal code uh, to put in uh, a, a law. We call it the corporate murder bill, but it's really criminal negligence causing death. So if your actions as a CEO or a member of the board or a, a senior management person, you're responsible for the production or whatever whatever that whatever work that enterprise carries out and if you don't take uh, precautions to protect the health and safety of workers then you may be criminal liable criminal liable for the death or the injury of that worker so that's what we pushed we had the law passed I worked on the lobby uh, we, we lo actually lobbied the government three separate times uh, before the law was passed it came in 13 years ago uh, it was unanimous and that was exceptional in the Parliament of Canada because back, back that time we had the Reform Party as well. Uh, so all, all five parties in the uh, in Parliament uh, agreed to pass the Westray Bill and our fight is still continuing to get it enforced. And, and do you think it, it has proven uh, good in the long run since I, the 13 years? It's, it's I, the no, no it, it's, it's not been applied very well. Um, and that's why we're, we're running this campaign now, uh, Stop the Killing and Force the Law. Because the law is not broken, it's just not enforced. So, uh, you know, we know in Canada, for example, uh, there's about a thousand workers that lose their lives because of work uh, every year. So, so think about this. About 13,000 workers have died because of their work since the West Ray Bill was passed. To date, there's been one successful prosecution and a jail sentence. Only one in 13,000. And we can give you many cases uh, where we think that criminal negligence did occur and workers lost their lives or were seriously injured. And there's been no enforcement and no political will to do so. Is there a specific industry in which it's more prominent? Uh, no, I think it's across the board. I mean, we did see uh, we did see a lot in the forest industry, a lot of uh, really unnecessary deaths in the forest industry. Mining, uh, some, some in mining. We've seen some real stupid stunts pulled by mining companies uh, that have taken lives or seriously injured people, with no uh, no criminal uh, charges laid, uh, regulatory charges, which to me are part of doing business, especially for a large mining company. A million dollar penalty, big deal. You know, you write it off anyway and carry on. So. Uh, you know, our, our campaign is, is really awareness. Our campaign is predicated simply on this, but one or two CEOs in jail, that's the paradigm shift that would cause a change in Canadian workplaces. Uh, because if people started looking over their shoulders and say, yeah, I'm responsible for the bottom line of this mining company. I have to report to the shareholders, uh, you know, that we're making money or losing money and this is why. I also have to report to the shareholders if my decisions and the decisions of our board and management cause a death, then we're criminally responsible and we could go to jail. 
that would rock the boardrooms in Canada, and that's what we're trying to do. Yeah. And again, we don't favor putting people in jail, but when you're negligent, it's the only part of our society where you can take a life, and there doesn't seem to be any real consequence. There was a there was a case recently, wasn't there, with uh, scaffolding? In uh, Ontario, yeah. the Metron case, where uh, yeah, where five workers fell. That's the case that was prosecuted. That's the one you were yeah, talking yeah, about. Yeah, and the wondering. foreman get three and a half years in jail. Mm -hmm. You know, people are not enough, but it, th that's what we're saying. It's 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 the, the simple fact that the the criminal code was changed because of deaths in the mining industry. Let's move on. Mm -hmm. Let's go. Yeah. Let's let's enforce that law. Let's remember those miners at uh, at Westray and their and their unfortunate contribution to the history of Canada and mining. Mm. So that you say that's the only one that's been enforced. In yeah, well, there's a couple that there's been plea bargains on, so there's been some charges laid, primarily in Quebec, uh, but the rest of the country is lagging behind. Um, now, maybe you could. Explain a bit how you got from uh, from where you began in the United States workers to being a director today of uh, District Three. Yeah, District Three, which is Western Canada. Western Canada, uh, for 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 this purpose, is uh, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, BC, Yukon, Northwest Territories, and Nunavut. So, big, uh, big as we sometimes joke, as we sometimes joke, bigger than most countries, but yeah. uh, that's our area, and we uh, we cover. All kinds of industries. Mining is, pri is our primary. Mining and forestry is our primary industries, but we do everything in between as well. Mm. So, pretty pretty big area. And and, and I started again uh, in the mining industry. Came out on staff as the steelworkers, service to the mining industry, and uh, and uh, ran for election. So uh, you know, I was elected uh, now about 13 years ago, and uh, as as the director of District Three and uh, have been there ever since, but but I, I think it was a reflection of my work and, uh, and 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 my drive to change things for the better, you know, and not run from a fight ever, you know, and uh, you know take on difficult issues. Mm -hmm. And I think with that, uh, that was born with my with my, my original my my original jobs in the mining industry. You know, it was really like I say, pick handle arbitration when we started. Do you have any um, cases where you worked, um, or cases that are worth mentioning at least, that have to do with big mining companies, whether it's out west or up north? Or? Yeah, sure. I mean, I I, uh, I, I participated in uh, in you know on the health and safety side with mining regulation review. Uh, that was always difficult as well because again, mining companies they don't inherently want to hurt somebody. They just I mean nobody does, and uh, I, I'd be really grossly unfair if I said that. Uh, but they have to be regulated. They have to be, and somebody has to oversee what's going on. It has to be a third party with, with, with some conviction to to stop practices that are dangerous or unhealthy. Um, so I did a lot of work in 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 that uh, throughout Western Canada in several jurisdictions. So that was always uh, entertaining. I also um, had had the, and this was a real privilege. I worked on on uh, at the ILO in Geneva. Uh, on a mining convention uh, that centered on health and safety of miners around the world. So, so, so my experience in Canadian mining, I think, really helped because, because when you're working on a convention like that, um, you're working with people that have no laws in their country or any laws they have are not enforced. And in mining, because Canadian mining companies are so big and so multinational, I could be talking to a Peruvian miner that works for a Canadian mining company. It could be tech, mm -hmm. and and we can really explain to those workers the differences between Canadian mining and and mining in Peru. Same equipment, same processes. Uh, compensation is not very good. The way people are treated is oftentimes not very good. To, you know, to our standards, I mean Peruvian standards. If that, if that was the country we're talking about, well, you know, they're paid well. Probably better than most, but you know what we do say to them is the commodity you're mining, whether it be copper, gold, silver, doesn't matter. It's uh, mined in Peruvian pesos and um, sold at U.S. dollars, so the margins are huge. So we're able to help on health and safety. There is a language that I can talk about, 
and it doesn't matter what real language we speak. Everybody knows that when you jam your fingers in something, it hurts. So that language is really it's simple. That it's an international language. If you're breathing dust in, and it's uh, it's it's going to cause silicosis. Um, it's really not hard to explain to people that, for the most part, that disease has been eradicated in Canada. It used to be rampant in the mining industry. We don't see very much of it anymore. And there's an easy way to resolve that, you know, by ventilating and and uh, and uh, watering. So that's. That's rewarding. Uh, I enjoyed those trips, uh, uh, you know, to help uh, workers around the world. Traveled all over, uh, especially in the mining industry. Worked in uh, a lot in South America. Worked with the National Union miners in uh, in South Africa as well as they were coming out of apartheid and uh, you know really learning how to be a union. Um, I mean, nobody has to tell South Africa how to stand up and fight, but. But they were dealing now with companies and, and, a, and a culture that where they had rights they didn't have before. So, it, 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 you know, it wasn't just good enough to say, well, you have right, you have all these rights. You don't know how to use them. So we uh, we helped and uh, and continue to help with that. So all that's been very very rewarding. Uh, you know, and again, uh, drawing the link with Canadian mining companies has been helpful as well. They. Uh, they're always friendly when we show up in different countries. They don't like it, but uh, we know that. But uh, they don't want to chase us away because it's embarrassing at home. So, so when you go to uh, when the United States workers go to other countries, is it always in relation to Canadian companies in other countries, or could it often be foreign companies? Uh, sometimes it's foreign, but most often it's uh, Canadian companies or just mining in general. So we know, we know, for example, uh, Rio Rio Tinto is, a, is an Australian company, but they're all over the, they're all over Canada, for example. So we run into Rio Tinto workers everywhere, and we tell we 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 have a Rio Tinto conference that we participate in, and we tell uh, we tell stories about what they're doing in Canada. We also hear stories about what they're doing in other countries, especially developing countries, and we hear the horror stories of uh, of what they do, or uh, Hud Bay, Hudson Bay mining and smelting. Um, I just saw a court case coming out of uh, out of I'm not sure if it was Honduras, but but anyway, it's, it's somewhere around Central America, I think. I just saw it where they're charged uh, in a Canadian court um, with uh, atrocities. Uh, with respect to farmers and uh, families of farmers, pretty nasty stuff. They're denying, obviously, and they have the right to do that. But it's interesting that we we are now seeing a lot more of that, and the connection with uh, with not only mining unions but environmentalists and uh, and NGOs in uh, in different countries is pretty good. Yeah, yeah, it must be getting trickier and trickier, I guess, because of how international and intermingled the business is becoming or has become already. Yeah, I think so. And I mean, my, uh, Canadian mining companies are aware of that now and they're fighting to ensure that, you know, laws in Canada don't change too much and they fight hard. Yeah, you know, they like it the way it is and most are responsible. Say that, most companies, most mining companies don't go out to hurt people or or take their land away or poison their water. They, uh, they try to do their best. They could do better. And again, oversight I think is always important for a mining company. Have you seen a change too, not only because of the the pressure of the unions, but also the pressure of, uh, I don't know, I'd say in the last 10, 20 years, there's now this whole sustainability um, push, whether, whether it's various stakeholders. Yeah, no, I, I think it, it, they changed reluctantly. They, they're kicking and screaming all the way there, but they changed. And uh, I think it's for the better. Uh, they still resist. Uh, but they'll have a whole now, a whole department now. All these major mining companies on the environment and sustainability, and they, you know, they put nice statements out and stuff like that. And every now and then they screw up fairly significantly. But, uh, but for the most part, I think they are trying, and uh, and they're uh, they are, I think, trying to mine sustainably everywhere because the consequences obviously are very very serious, and they are aware of the downside of not mining sustainably. Yeah, that's a threat. So they got that one. Now, uh, these maybe maybe um, you have no information uh, on these, but I just figured I'd ask. And mm -hmm. that's um, uh, anything about the worker and management relations for Defasco or Stelco? No, I I don't know. No, uh, okay. no, no. Okay. Uh, and Algoma? No. No. Okay. No. Perfect.
just figured I'd I'd uh, I'd ask. Well, we can move on a bit to uh, maybe some more social questions mm-hmm. to, towards what we were leaning on. Um, the first one is about women mm-hmm. in, uh, in the workplace, mm-hmm. and how uh, I asked everybody that: how present or absent have women been throughout? Um, your career, and we, you could look at both. You could look at more the the union side, and mm-hmm. also the mining side. Well, I mean, I think when I first started with the steelworkers, it was I think we were ninety five percent white male. So uh, you, you know, we didn't. Our union doesn't have a hiring hall, so we don't we don't draw people in through a hiring hall. The employers have to hire. So the mining industry is safe to say there was no women in the mining industry when I first started. I, I was involved in one of the very first projects where women started to come in, and that was simply out of necessity. The mining company had such a high turnover they couldn't keep guys, so they started recruiting women. Uh, but they were limited on what they could do. I remember those days uh, very, very well. It was hard to uh, to see a woman get hired, and uh, you know there were no facilities, there was no safety equipment, so it was tough. And I really, uh, I really, uh, you know, think back of. Uh, you know, those women in the mining industries were real pioneers. You know, there was all this folklore. You couldn't have a woman underground. You, you know, there's certain jobs they couldn't do. They physically couldn't do this or they couldn't do that. And, 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 and those sisters that started out proved everybody wrong. Uh, you know, and, uh, and I think today I see some companies that are progressive enough to hire women understand that you know, women can do any job a guy can do, trades, uh, equipment operating, it doesn't matter. You know, uh, women can be trained just like guys can be trained. And uh, provided that you uh, ensure that the facilities are there for them, I'm talking washroom, change rooms, basic stuff that you'd expect in any workplace. If you take care of that, it's good. Obviously, the equipment for women, boots, hats, you know, the, the, the equipment that women have to wear, uh, the safety equipment. It, it's all there. You, people can access it quite easily now, so there's no barriers uh, that should be in place for any sisters to get employed. And I see in some places wonderful results. Others still, uh, you know, we uh, we have a problem. You know, there's some mines that refuse to hire women. They don't say so, or they hire them in office jobs only and restrict them. But there's some underground mining operations that haven't had women in them ever, and you know. <laughs> I don't know. Call me call me naive, but there's no reason for that, other than somebody made a decision not to hire women. But I think we're making inroads. I think we're doing all right. You know, we can do better, and we have to push for that. Yeah. No, it is it is increasing. That's true. Well, I I, I tell you this. It, uh, I know we we took a, it's a great story because it it talks about this. With, in bargaining in 1989 with Tech at Highland Valley Copper, we merged two agreements. So we had what we called back then an office and technical workers uh, agreement. That was primarily women, and uh, and production and maintenance. That was all guys, and we put the two of them together. Then we had to get to the wage scale, and we thought, well, how do you slot people? You know, one collective agreement. And uh, the, the a cute story was uh, the receptionist. Receptionist had to type 40 words a minute and have something called. A well-modulated telephone voice. I don't know who would judge that, but that was written right in the collective agreement. At the end of the day, we were able to say, well, look, at if you hire a laborer with no skills, no skills, laborer gets maybe $4 an hour or more than that receptionist that has to have a college or university course, uh, type 40 words a minute, and have a well-modulated telephone voice. How does that work? So in the end, we had the, uh, we had the receptionist, for example, and all those jobs went up. Dramatically, some of them six, seven, eight dollars an hour overnight uh, because we just simply merged the sisters primarily in that bargaining unit into the uh, into the other bargaining unit, and uh, it was a nice, nice success story early on. So in '89 that happened. So I was really proud of that. Tech. It was Tech Highland Valley Copper, one of the big, big, big copper mine in uh, in British Columbia. Yeah. Uh, now. Um Another question, and that's uh, the question of um, Aboriginals. Yes. Um, and um, if through your history you have um, stories of the relations between um, the unions, the mining uh, industry, or certain companies, and Aboriginal peoples from whether it's BC, whether it's sure, Northwest sure. Stories. 
Yes, I mean, that's a tough one uh, because, because over the I, I know lots of First Nations people who have come to work in the mining industry, good steel workers, they do really, really good work. And I, I just simply reject some of the things I've heard from management on, on this question. I ask them all the time. Uh, you know, you want a, a source of workers. There's a First Nations, uh, uh, First Nations nation right beside you where five of them surrounding this mine, seems to me, you should be able to draw people in there. And I've heard bluntly, well, you know, can't get those guys to work. You know, I mean, pure racist uh, stuff. And, and, you know, and I argue with them, well, you know what? If you hire 10 and, you, and, and, you, and two make it, that's a success. It's not a failure. And the other eight, maybe the timing wasn't right. Maybe they're in their life right now, they have more important things. And remember, we're dealing with, with people that haven't had opportunities to learn. Uh, you know, for example, how do you take a person who's never driven a car and say, we're going to make you a, a truck driver in a mine? How does that work? Do you not think that that person's intimidated to the point where they simply say, I can't, or I'm afraid, but I don't want to say so? We really have to take steps to, uh, to, 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 to make workplaces much more welcoming. Not just say the words, we actually have to do the actions. I find that's deficient in many places. Having said that, there are some mining companies that are pretty good. Uh, some are not. Um, and uh, we're trying uh, really hard to, uh, to negotiate um, uh, at least the opportunity for employment for First Nations. It's difficult. And it, it's difficult to work with some of the some of the First Nations as well because there's a lack of trust. They don't know who we are. Uh, you know, oftentimes they think, "Well, you're adversarial." That's culturally foreign uh, as well. And uh, you know, so we're in there saying, "No, no, no. We'll, we'll negotiate. We'll negotiate positions. You just find the people to come to work, and uh, we'll, we'll we'll do that." And we've had some pretty good success. Some not so successful, but we're trying. The good one in, in historical terms for you that might you might want to look up is is an agreement called the Dona Lake Agreement, and it was at Placer Dome's mine in northern Ontario. Are you familiar with that? Um, I know Placer Dome, but um, well, the, the Dona I'm Lake mine, story, Dona Lake, and Dona Lake was uh, it was I believe it was called the Muscle White Mine. It's now got to be probably twenty five years ago. We negotiated that agreement after the ban negotiated with Placer, a land use agreement. And the land use agreement basically was fraught with quotas. We'll, we'll hire so many people, we'll do this, we'll do that. And they just went through the motions. They got to those numbers, said, okay, we've done our, our, our quote, quote, and uh, you know, let's move on. Uh, they came to us and we took the land use agreement, actually bargained it into the collective agreement. It was innovative, uh, very innovative for its time. So for example, most collective agreements are predicated on seniority, subject to abilities. But if two people have relatively equal abilities, the senior person gets the job. In the Dora Lake agreement, we went further and we said, look, if there's two people competing for the job and their skill sets are relatively equal, First Nations person will get the job. That was shockingly foreign to us, you know, and uh, and well, we were proud of it. And we had people that, uh, as again, had no education to speak of, had no real life skills other than you know real life uh, on a on a reserve, which is pretty tough for people. And we we made them into real miners, you know, with real real careers and. Uh, uh, it was. I was really, really, really uh, pleased with that. We've tried to replicate that in numerous places. I don't think we've had the same success as that ever. But, but again, it's lack of trust, uh, both from the employers, governments, uh, and, and and the nations themselves. And then there's polit politics and all of that, which is which you have to come to learn how to how to how to try to. Get through, and it's it, it it takes a lot of time and patience to get there, but it's good work. So the policy in that mind was that it wasn't just like a affirmative action where it was like a percentage. No, no, it was direct. It was, it was absolutely direct. Wow. That uh, you know, if you were a member of the band, then you had you had preference in a lot of places. You know, for training, and and then and then just simple stuff. We we had a provision in that collective agreement at wild rice season. Well, rice, well, rice gathering is traditional in that area. 
So when while, while race, uh, when the harvest had to be done, people were given time off work without penalty to, to gather uh, gather rice. If you're on your way to work and you saw a moose, you took the moose because that's what fed your family. You weren't denied your job because you stopped to shoot a moose on the way to work. You just came in late, and there was no no issues over there. Was at the start, but sooner, you know, in time, we all learned to work with that. Said, so, you know, this guy, you know, that's that's what happens when uh, when you live. Uh, on uh, on reserves, or at that time on reserves that are remote, <clears throat> you took care of your family first, which might mean your extended family. Might be your mom, your dad, your aunt, your uncle, but you were going to provide. And that was cultural, and it was difficult. It was really difficult. I can't say it wasn't, but uh, but I was really proud of what we did there. And uh, and again, we try to we try to replicate that uh, constantly. We always, oftentimes, talk about Dola Lake. And our successes there, and and in the opposite way, were <clears throat> many of these um, First Nations able to adapt themselves to the to the workforce? Oh well, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was you know, that, 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 yeah, yeah. There was. I mean, time is not linear often, but uh, but people did, and it was unique. We had some funny stories. You know, you'd have uh, you know a guy that was you know you know doing something in the mine. He was employed, and he'd have something else to do. He'd send his brother, <laughs> and we thought, well, that was kind of funny, but. You know that's life, and you have to adapt. And uh, you know, I I'm really in favor of that. I think you know, life doesn't stop because there's a different way to do things. You know, we just have to adjust. And clearly, work doesn't stop. That ore has been in the ground for a million years. It'll be there for a million more. We might be delayed. We might be delayed for four hours or or six hours or God forbid a day, but we're gonna we're gonna get the work done. Now, um, throughout your career, what um, are there specific issues that you believe have been pretty much solved, or you've seen, you know, from past decades really don't exist you know, as much? <clears throat> well, I think we've made uh, some inroads on health and safety, especially the health part. You know, where I said earlier in the interview, you know, we've seen the eradication almost of silicosis and some nasty uh, diseases that took miners' lives. Um, I, I think, you know, health and safety, you talk about mining history, we had the first ever strike over health and safety at Elliott Lake, uh, now 41 years ago, I think it was, and uh, <clears throat> because of that, um, every worker in Canada has the right to refuse unsafe work, has the right to know what hazards exist in their workplace, and has the right to participate on health and safety committees. It was our work. And, uh, and the work of the Elliott Lake miners that brought that to every single Canadian. That's a huge accomplishment. Uh, that, you know, was born in the mining industry uh, out, of, out of real necessity. I mean, they were killing workers. And they, they, even today, uh, we see workers still dying of cancers because of their exposures in the uranium mines. So, so I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not happy about the genesis of how that happened. Uh, but but I am happy with the results, uh, and 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 we're still pushing to make sure that people don't forget that and don't forget the sacrifice that those workers gave. And is there still today one uh, maybe there are multiple but one really burning issue that that needs to be tackled right now? Uh, I think uh, I think just workers' rights, uh, obviously. Uh, pensions, uh, you know, we've done well in most of the mining industry, although there's an attack on pension plans uh, by mining companies, a needless attack, but uh, but it, it's there nonetheless. Uh, they make so much money uh, in good times. Uh, I tease them all the time. Uh, they said, you guys should mine grapes because you're really in the mining industry. <laughs> uh, you, you know, when they make phenomenal profits, they're happy, uh, and, and when they're not, they're not happy. But on average, they do very, very well, uh, you know, over the cycle of, uh, of the commodity prices, and they do well. Uh, but it, it's interesting. I, I tease them too. I said, "You guys never heard of a bank? You know, when you're making billions, don't you put some away? <laughs> you know, the cycle's going to drop. It's predictable." Uh, I, I think th that kind of in the mining industry, we, we go through those cycles with needless, needless conflict uh, because if 
if if we got together and said, okay, we, we all know the industry, we all know we're we're going to have highs and lows, so let's adjust our our uh, approach. Uh, I, I've applied with mining companies to try to do that to no avail. When the price drops, they come after us. It's predictable. Mm. So I'd like to see a change of that. I don't think I ever will, but that's a problem. Yeah. Yeah, it's actually, <coughs> you mentioned it, it was mentioned uh, with that name so, mm -hmm. a while ago. Mm -hmm. Because of its cyclical nature, it's kind of, it affects a lot of the, the bargaining or, yep. you know, the salaries even, stuff yep. like that. Yep. So. Um, a few, uh, few last questions. Um, one, this one, no wrong answer really. It's um, your opinion. So this one's kind of a, a nearful, but in your opinion, are there any events, uh, people, disasters, anything whatsoever that you believe must be mentioned when discussing the history of unions and the natural resources in Canada? Well, I think there's uh, well, I think there's a number of them. Uh, I, I, you know, I don't know who's spoken to you before me, but uh, Homer Sagan, who was a who was a pioneer um, in uh, in the mining industry in Sudbury, uh, did a lot of work on the health and safety side, and environmental side. Before anybody even talked about the environment, he was in Sudbury. I mean, like environment in Sudbury, uh, especially in the you know the 50s and 60s, uh, he was a real pioneer. Paul Falkowski uh, was another uh, guy that worked uh, for the steelworkers. Um, he was a real health and safety activist. He's, uh, he's, he's, I, think he's I, think, I think he stays, or he lives in Toronto. I think he goes to Florida for the winter. He's retired. But he, he did innovative, creative fight back campaigns before we knew what fight back was. And, uh, you know, there was a, Canadian, a CBC Canadian uh, program this, this hour has seven days. He exposed uh, on that program with a hidden camera, when cameras were bigger than this room, uh, the plight of workers at the smelter in Sudbury. Uh, you know the exposures and uh, and really uh, did you know hard, hard, uh, dangerous work. You know back then because the police would arrest you and beat you. You know and uh, it was tough. Vince Reddy, uh, who was a, a steelworker. Um, who worked uh, primarily in the mining industry and did all this stuff and you know in the far north I mean we used to, have, we, we used to call them tramp miners so you'd have a miner that would go mine to mine every two years or when the mine shut down they would move on. Uh, he, he was a champion for uh, helping those workers because oftentimes and I remember him giving me a lecture once about pensions uh, when I was much younger and I said ah, you know if they just paid me I don't have to worry about a pension and I get a lecture I'll never forget. And he says, look, I worked with miners that were broken and destitute when they retired. They made these companies millions of dollars and through no fault of their own. You know, they worked for a company that went bankrupt or shut down. And, uh, you know, the riches they took from uh, the country, uh, they took and, and kept. And the people that earned those riches were left, you know, shattered. Uh, you know, their bodies broken, their lungs, uh, uh, you know, damaged. And uh, and their minds uh, oftentimes were, were were shot, and you know they lived in Skid Row. Um, so he he taught me lessons about that that I think they're important to, to know. And also also he knew the uh, the miners, Al King, uh, who's now passed away. Al was uh, was the Western director of the uh, mine mill and smelter workers, which was regarded as a a communist union back in the communist days, and he. Uh, he was branded a communist and was not allowed to travel to uh, the United States ever. Uh, he was barred admission in the United States because he was a, a communist. But he was a trade unionist first, not a communist. He was a trade unionist. And uh, even if he was a communist, who cares? Especially in Canada. But we had the U.S. anti-communist shit going on. So he was, uh, he was a great activist and a, and a great unionist. And he, he, uh, he did his fights in, uh, in the mining industry and in smelting industry. He he represented workers uh, all over um, all over Western Canada, but primarily British Columbia. So small rat hole mining operations that showed up, and you know once they exhausted the high grade ore, they were gone. Uh, and uh, and the workers at Trail at the primary lead smelter in Trail, he uh, he he worked there and uh, wrote a book actually called Red Bait, and uh, a pretty good book, funny funny stories. He told stories with a funny twist and. Uh, 
uh, you know, we miss him, but uh, he was he was a great contributor to the history of mining uh, in Western Canada, anyway. So he's he's one that uh, is worth mentioning as well. A uh, few uh, two two last questions. First is, um, what are you proudest of um, throughout your career? I think uh, you know bargaining our collective agreements and, uh, and and doing health and safety. So two of them, I think, health and safety. Uh, simply because of this. The work that we do in health and safety you don't see, or you see it, I see it, but, uh, but it takes a long time. And, and there's no way to quantify the work that we do, because if you save somebody's life, how do you know? You know? If you do something, your actions to prevent illnesses or serious injuries, if it saves a life, I talked earlier about Westrick, if we can encourage a manager or a CEO to make a decision that puts safety in front of profit, and it saves a life. Who knows? That's our work. That's what we do. Mm -hmm. I think as well on bargaining, when we take a collective agreement and bargain improvements in wages, pensions, and benefits, oftentimes our members come in off the street. They have no skills. We ensure that they're trained. There's language that enables them to be trained either as a uh, Equipment operators, process operators, tradespeople, they get a decent salary. So, so you can envision this. Yesterday you're working at McDonald's. Today you're making $45 an hour and you're going to get a pension for life. You're going to break the cycle of poverty. You're going to take your family and your kids are going to be able to go to university. You'll be able to go on holidays. You'll be able to have a car. You know, that's what we do and, and we get... I think no credit for that in the mainstream media uh, and generally in society. We're often seen as, oh, you're greedy bastards. You guys are, you know, it's all for you, you fat cat labor leaders. I think what we do to, for society is, uh, is, is so, so important. And, uh, you know, we see this playing out in the United States right now. We heard a little bit in the, in the last election here. Where is the middle class and who creates them? If not for us, then who? There's the question. If not for us, then who would do it? Think industry, think the mining company would pay people 45 bucks an hour? Are you kidding? Do you think they'd volunteer? Do you think that the CEO of Tech or Valet or Hudson Bay Mining Smelting wakes up in the middle of the night and says, I couldn't sleep tonight or last night because I make so much money and I'm getting up today to share it with my workers. Do you think that would happen in real life? Shit, no. So, so, so I, I think the work that we do, <laughs> again, it comes to that last question. If not us, then who? So I'm proud of that. Thank you. Last question, and that's if you were speaking to someone much younger, like a student, for example. Um, that student could be thinking of getting into the mining industry. Yep. What? Uh, piece of advice or life lesson would you give this person? I, I'd say go for it. Go for it. If you get it, first off, get an education. Uh, you know, go to university, get some skills, uh, learn. Uh, if you can't, uh, you know, if your circumstances are you can't get to university, then by all means go. Uh, you know, uh, if you get to university, then again, be a, you know, if you can become a mining engineer or a, uh, an electrical engineer, any of those uh, types of uh, types of disciplines. That can't hurt, and the mining industry is a great profession. It uh, it pays well. Uh, you you know you, you you really the work is interesting. It's really not mundane, same thing every day. It's it's it, it is uh, it is a good industry to be in, and and it uh, as long as you take care of yourself uh, and don't allow bad things to happen to yourself uh, with respect to your work, it's a good career, great career for people. Well, thank you. Okay.